Hi, Zara. Hi. It's, such a pleasure to, it's such a pleasure to see you and meet you in this strange digital way, but you know, in a live way. And I really do admire your work. I've, Thank I've, you. um, I've really taken a lot of pleasure looking through the body of your work and, and I'm quite amazed by it. Um, so um, I wish I could see your show in person. Wow. <laughs> I wish we could go and see anything right now. I know, I know. It's like an ache, but yeah. But anyway, so I, I I'm working on a piece um, that I'm going to premiere digitally um, um, through the Aga Khan Museum, and it's a film. Uh, I'm not a filmmaker, although I, I did study filmmaking uh, a long time ago. Um, I but I do create these kind of immersive projective light installations and everything crashed down when the pandemic arrived and all of my international exhibitions were canceled and so for about a month I sort of sat in this space <laughs> and stared out the window and wondered about this organism that was making its way slowly through almost eight billion of us and I wondered at the incredible uh, potential for this organism to change and and how it worked and what the mechanisms were behind the manifestation of the disease and so I spent a lot of time chatting um, you know with with scientists and immunologists and and primary care physicians and and then it became kind of a molecular mystery theater for me so I started looking into the shapes of these molecules that were associated with the manifestation of disease so the spike protein on the surface of the virus and the and the ACE2 receptor that binds with it to bring it into the cell and and the human molecule that copies that code and all of these different interactions and so I ended up finding a fantastic academic site that allowed me to um, to use three dimensional three dimensional uh, models of these different molecules and and I had a beautiful uh, projection system in my studio um, that was sitting idle and I started working outside, which is my favorite place to work um, to project work uh, onto living onto a living canvas. So for me, I think a theme in all of my work is kind of the interconnectedness of the material world of living things and, um, and inanimate things. And so um, this piece really is about perspective. It's called Iam, which is Latin for now. And it is um, it basically is a, a COVID story told in four acts through dance and light. And each act takes place at a different scale of material reality. So the piece begins in the molecular realm. And then the second act is the human realm filled with emotion and experience. And the third act is the planetary realm. So this kind of living sphere outside of, you know, human um, experience and the fourth act is the cosmos so it's really how this story is playing out in each one of these realms and um, so the first piece uh, is finished and this is what's going to air in the beginning of March and it is um, so it's really the story of the coronavirus getting into the cell replicating and leaving Hi, nice to meet you, Radha. It was really nice to see your work as well and to be introduced into this conversation. Um, and I think in, in some ways, I think a lot of artists are talking and thinking about coronavirus and the situation we are in and lockdown. And this is something that's never happened before in living memory, this idea of quarantine and everybody quarantining and being locked down into their homes and thinking of ways to be creative or to engage with something that's so almost is real in that it's happening and people are dying and people are falling sick, but it's also this kind of transparent thing that we know about. We know what it looks like, but it's this kind of, it's this virus that we can't get our heads around. And yesterday here in England, there was a mathematician that worked out all the coronavirus that exists in the world would fit into a Coke can. <laughs> all of the molecules, <laughs> all, all of it, even the big molecules fit in all of it around the world would fit into one coke can so it's fascinating to me how this one tiny little thing can derail almost the whole of humanity right you know we, we've had to stop everything 
our economies are down, we can't travel anymore, we can't go out, we can't go to exhibitions. And it's, it's actually a very small, tiny little thing. Um, that affects us humans. And it reminds us, I think, for me, one of the big things, it reminds us of how human we are. And I think we can forget how vulnerable we are to illness and disease and sickness. And I especially think when you're young, you think you're invincible <laughs> and you're going to get through and life's going to carry on. And then something like this happens that really makes you stop and think, hang on, this tiny little virus can make people so ill and make them so sick and and it's something that we're beginning to understand but we don't really really comprehend so yeah at the beginning so this time last year in March we went into our first lockdown here in London and it was a shock it was a shock to the system because you know in January February we were hearing things about coming from China and then the, the, this big thing happened right we're locking down everyone's going to stop and you're going to be at home and I was in my studio at the time and I had a different show I was waiting for materials and because everything stopped I couldn't work on that exhibition anymore because I was waiting for some pieces to arrive and I needed some specialist equipment so I couldn't do that so I just went back to painting on paper and because the coronavirus and the whole thing affects the breath I went back to a series of paintings called the breath paintings and I started to photograph them put them on Instagram there's something here in the UK called the artist support pledge got involved in that and then just things snowballed and you know the exhibition in the states came about through that conversation about the breathing in and the breathing out and the idea of spirituality in that and, and how most major spiritual and religious traditions in the world have something to say about the breath you know in, in hinduism it's prana in, in, in Islam, it's the idea that God breathes life into Adam. That's where life comes from. Our life force is from the breath. In China, it's qi. And it's so fascinating to try and visualize that in an artistic way of the breath in and the breath out. And I did quite a lot of research on that. And it's fascinating. It was really interesting. Hmm. Hmm. You know, when you're talking about us and this, you know, almost infinite number of tiny, you know, viral particles that could fit in a Coke can and how it's derailed us. And, you know, it really makes me think about, um, about what we think us is. Mm. So we, we tend to think that we have this province and autonomy over ourselves, but what we really think of as us is, <laughs> it's really more mind than body, you know, because the, we think we're in control of ourselves, but we're not running any of the molecular processes that sustain us. We don't, we barely know, you know, even, even science knows just a tiny bit about how all of it really works and functions to sustain us. We're still just, at, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So it's kind of, you know, thinking that you're in control of your life is kind of a, a fallacy in a way um because we're really not even driving our own bus molecular yeah. we have no you know and so we kind of have to accept that us is actually something that is really broadly connected to our entire environment and all of the organisms in it it's not just you know uh, we're not we're not we don't exist in a vacuum uh, i remember having a conversation with somebody about our body temperature and our body temperature, mine, yours, anybody's, anywhere in the world right now is around 37.5 C. Are you metric or imperial? I don't know if you're <laughs> in Canada, but we're here in the UK, we're, we're Celsius. Here. <laughs> so, so, you know, everybody in the world, most humans hover around 37 Celsius. And if you go one above to 38, you're seriously ill. You go one below, you're seriously ill, whether you're in the Arctic or whether you're in Africa. And, you know, 99% of the world probably have no idea how that pro the meta metabolic thing happens. Our bodies maintain a constant temperature, whether we're asleep, whether we're eating, whether we're out in the cold. We, our human body, our cell, everything about our function conspires to keep us at this amazing consistent temperature. Yet nobody knows, really, most people, except for specialised scientists, how our body does that. And it's <laughs> fascinating to me that how little we really think about ourselves and our physicality um, and how it just 
goes, you know, it works. It works. And it's only really, and this is something I've talked about a lot, it's only when things go wrong, when you suddenly, you can't do anything anymore. And when I, 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 I couldn't breathe properly, and when you suddenly you can't breathe properly and breathing hurts, and I had to have surgery to correct my breathing, then you realise this thing that you do. I mean, I think I, 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 I think it's 13,500 breaths a day, but you don't, you're not conscious of those breaths every day that you take in and out until something goes wrong. And then you feel every single one. It's how you miss your sense of smell when you have a cold or when you have something, a scratch or something, you realise how good everything is when it's working. When it goes wrong, you really intertune with this thing, this mechanism of ours, this bodily function, which most of the time works amazingly. And yet the processes behind it and how it works and the science of it, we don't know. And we don't even think about really. And that's quite interesting to me. Um, and it's something that's worth considering from a scientific point of view. In And, and there's a, like you said, there's a lot of things scientists don't understand as well. When you really get down to certain things, you say to them, well, how do you know? How do you know this works like this? And they just say, you know, we can observe things. But we don't really, some things, we don't really know how they work. And um, there's that spiritual side of it as well, of being, well, aren't we an amazing complex machine that works? And how, why, and how, inter it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to reflect on that. There's nothing to say that we would, any human being would even be here without the co-evolution of viruses. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why that, that really motivated me to, to sort of create this, the piece Eon and, and the start in the molecular realm is that I think I was just so, um, I wasn't surprised by the level of fear that we've experienced globally, but I was, I was, uh, you know, a little bit upset by how, um, that fear was making us behave in really kind of unintelligent ways. And, and so I think that where there's this fear of the unknown, um, we, we panic. And then, you know, we've seen globally just the effects of that kind of panic and fearfulness. And I think that if we, you know, I choose curiosity over fear. And I think that to be curious about this thing, this pathogen that's moving through all of us, that's that's sweeping its way through humanity, to be curious about it and to try and understand it a little bit, it, it takes the, the fear out of it to, to just turn the thinking around and think, well, okay, none of us likely would be here without viruses. So here we have this organism and we can describe what's happening with this organism in our bodies in terms of warfare, you know, using the language of immunology and disease, but you cannot, you cannot deny the fact that it's a human molecule that brings this virus into a human cell. It's a human molecule that copies this virus and, and sends it back out into the world. That there's an interrelationship of, of all of these um, sort of elements that, that is is kind of larger. The story is deeper and longer than we can perceive in this slice of time. Um, and maybe that, that, that curiosity of, of thinking about this kind of interrelationship of organisms, you know, on our planet can, can sort of take some of the, the fear out of the equation and, um, and calm us a little bit. My training is mainly as a painter, using paint, paintbrushes, water, color. And, but I was always really interested in technology and it's very, working digitally is very different to working um, with, with paint and tubes of paint, the understanding of color, the way color works, the way color transitions into other colors. And, you know, initially I was using um, code because I was interested in the maths and the algorithms, which share a picture. And um, so I, the first, uh, hang on, I'll sh share a picture. So the first, animation that I did, can you see this, was um, in 2005, and it was an animation, oops, um, can, you, can you see these things I'm sharing? Yes. Yeah, and here it is again, and, and this was a pattern based on five, originally from Iran, and I was quite 
intrigued because I, I, I love Islamic geometry and I love maths. And I was just wanting to know if anybody animated it before. Had anyone ever, you know, this just seemed to me like a logical thing to do. And back then in 2005, I don't think, you know, it was digital art or the way that people were working with this type of, you know, material was that was going on so much. And I just thought what was extraordinary was that um, the way I made this was that we, we, we were using very simple uh, coding C++. And if you see this pattern, it's, it replicates itself 10 times. So each bit is repeated. So we, we, we took one segment into the computer and then we gave each shape a number and a label so a1 of the first ring b2 and so on all the way up to f or whatever it was and then um we programmed every single shape to transition through the colors and then i chose the colors so it go from blue to purple or pink to red and then basically the way that the, the, the software was designed the coding was done we just pressed the space key and we let it run and it was extraordinary in that it was really really nice that once you let the computer run the patterns and the colors and the combinations kind of evolved themselves. I wasn't, as a painter would, I wasn't painting every single piece with a paintbrush individually. The computer program just ran with going through the sequences that I designed. And we could, we could, we could play with the colors and we could mess around with the colors. But once we initially made it, it was almost infinite what we could do as a digital toy as it were. I mean, it was it was kind of just really, really, for me, it was really interesting. Um, oh, I'll go back to it. Yep. So uh, for me, it was just quite interesting what you can do digitally that you can't do as a painter or with a physical object. You can create these things and you can play in a way. And I think the main, for me, the main thing is that the hardest thing to do is to limit yourself, to limit your palette, to control the possibilities because you can go crazy you know there's like 1.6 million colors apparently in the rgb spectrum so it's about how do you refine it how do you keep it tight how do you create something that's sympathetic and meditative and, and beautiful rather than that just goes through every single color that you possibly can and it was just it was it's, it's a very very different i don't know about you Rod. it's a very different way of working than a physical painting or sculpture or doing things with your hand, doing things digitally. It's, it's satisfying. It's really interesting. It's enjoyable, but it's, it's working in a very different headspace for me anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I find working in the digital realm that the process is always kind of frustrating a little bit and hair pulling, et cetera, and, and lengthy, laborious, but the final effect can be very profound in, in that in the work that you just showed us, I mean, you have happy accidents sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you have happy accidents, like like nature, and the, yeah. and and when you're finished, you know, you you could run your piece, and it's slowly changing over time, which is evolution. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of connects you with a with a natural process that you're surrounded by in, in a different way. Like I think, you well, know, what's interesting about digital work is that. When I say to people, it's just as handmade, it's every single bit <laughs> is as considered. And you know, it is hand, when people say, oh no, it's not handmade, it's digital. It's digital and almost, it's an accusatory thing. And I get that sometimes like, oh, well the computer did it. And it's like, no, the computer didn't do it. I had to think it, I had to draw it, I had to put it in. But there's this real prejudice that the computer did it and somehow it's easy. And I think in many ways, it's, it's almost harder working in a digital I, I framework. Think it is. I find it is. Mm -hmm. To get something really pleasing and to get what you envisage and to work it can be so frustrating as well. <laughs> well, and uh, that's the thing. When you make something with your hands... Um, You're much more in control, I think. Yeah, and for me, I find the process itself is meditative especially if you've been through it a million times before, then you're going through these patterns and it's that it's the making of it that is kind of meditative and in motion and fluid and most akin to an evolutionary kind of process. But the finished product is, is still with a sculpture or a painting, it's static, it's not in motion. And, and so it, it doesn't, 
it's different. It's just entirely different. And I agree with you. It's, it's difficult. It's laborious and it's challenging. And, um, it's, uh, it requires an awful lot of effort to, to manifest, uh, pieces that you're satisfied with digitally. And I also find there's a whole, there's a whole thing about a pr if it's digital, it can't be spiritual. If it's, yeah. If it's digital art, it can't be traditional art. It can't be art in the tradition of Islam. And I'm like, why? Why? Who, who made those rules? <laughs> who is the king of, you know, art in the world that says you mustn't? You know, and I find that almost, say, for example, with miniature painting, people can see the brush strokes and people know how it happens. And I think people know more about the process. They can imagine yeah. someone sitting there and painting a lovely miniature painting and they can see that, oh, well, that's, I don't know, 1,500 hours of work and that's so spiritual because they've spent that time and they've ground the pigments and there's all this labour attached or they can physically see it in their heads. With digital work, even if you've spent that much time and that much energy and that much blood and effort and sweat and tears, there's this feeling of, it, oh, it, it can't be that difficult because computers are fun and play and you are... I think there's an assumption that computers are Facebook and social media, but not creative or creation, making art. You're, you're constantly evolving. You're constantly changing. Your body changes. Your body's getting older and you're becoming aware of becoming older. So you're seeing these subtle changes in yourself, but your mind changes. And I think the person who's, who's not your spirituality, your understanding of God, your understanding of compassion, your understanding of all those things in your 20s very much change by the time you're 40 and you 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 kind of set on the path on, on what you believe so i think that's really really interesting and i think that the work for me is a kind of is it, i'm on a journey of life and of understanding a kind of problems or or sometimes you know some sometimes you have you're in a really good space with religion and spirituality and you, you, you know, it's really inspiring. And sometimes you're not. And all these things happen to you in your life. And I, 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 I'm, I'm a mother. I gave birth. I have children that had a big impact on me that changed my life completely. And then that I think feeds into the work. So you're constantly evolving. You're constantly changing and the spirituality and the understanding and the meaning of life changes as you watch your parents go older and frail and in your 20s you probably answer back a little bit and you're a bit cheeky to your parents and you think they're going to live forever and now I'm 40 I think you know my mom and dad are getting frail you know and it's my job to look after them so all these things are evolving and changing and the work has to process that the work of who you are as an artist has to encompass that real reality of living in in a life and I, I think that and, and the understanding of faith is really meaningful within those parameters. Does that make sense? I mean, you know. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, I, I feel also that that you know your your spirituality, your your soul really changes over time with your your experience. And you know, for me, I mean, if I think of spirituality as being you know, um, really concerned with the human spirit or the soul. It's, it's that practice of spirituality, as you say, Amir, is like a research. It's a, it's a questing. It's always changing because your experience, you know, gives you a platform from which to examine these issues. And, and in that same way, you know, I think I see personally science as a way of knowing also. But it's science is a way of knowing about the material world and and it's always changing, you know, as our tools get of investigation get better. Um, it our understanding changes and and it's kind of like as you live a life and you gain more experience, then you know the tools that you have at your disposal to sort of investigate your life spiritually. They're also changing and they're also ideally improving. Um, I, used to but, <laughs> I had a really funny conversation because I'm I'm talking on WhatsApp to my brothers. I'm, I've got a family group, my brothers and sisters, and I post because I'm working on an exhibition for for September of, of kind of large scale sculptural, very very intricate geometric uh, pieces, which I've been working on for a while. 
And um, it got delayed because of COVID and delayed again. So hopefully the exhibition will go ahead in September. And I sent pictures to my brothers and sisters and my brother sent me a, a text saying, oh, this piece that you've done is brilliant. It's really good. I think it's one of the best pieces you've ever done. How come you didn't do this 15 years ago? I mean, <laughs> you didn't know like this ages ago. You know, yeah, we had a load of success. And I'm like, I couldn't have. I can yeah. only make the work now. Because mm -hmm. I am where I am now because of all the all the disasters and all the bad experiences and all the mistakes I've made and all the colours I've got wrong. And you can only be where you are where you are because of what your experience have led you to have. I can only understand colour the way I do, or the way I understand geometry and shape, and maybe having kids changes you. All these things impact on who you are. And it's 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 an, it's a journey, it's not a destination. And yeah, I, I definitely believe that we're all on our path, you know, and for different people, it's it's very different. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll meet somebody who's in their 20s or 25 and you think, wow, this person has an old soul. They're really, you know, and, and sometimes you'll meet someone in their 70s who behaves like a teenager, but everyone's on their own path and their own journey and uh, the way of understanding life and, and, and the way that they see themselves and how they interact with the world is evolving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to, to think of that, that this is kind of material evolution and the spiritual evolution and some of the similarities, mm. you know, just thinking about, you know, the patterns that repeat in nature, you know, over and over again, there's these certain shapes that you see over and over again, there's this, this kind of spirals or, you know, the branching pattern or, and how it's always the environment that is is having an influence on the development of those shapes and patterns and then for me i relate that to the idea of of you know repeating the same mistakes over and over again these patterns that we're locked into spiritually and ultimately learning to to not make these mistakes and and to sort of find release from you know these patterns that always keep sort of repeating and causing us a suffering right but it's it's the experience I, of I, I, show us that i think going back to the old the, the greeks and their you know uh fibonacci numbers and the golden mean i find an enormous amount of comfort in the fact that a square is always is always going to be a square and an equilateral triangle is always going to be an equilateral triangle and pi is always pi and fibonacci is always fibonacci and it's always going to be like that and when my kids learn it i find that i find there's an enormous amount of comfort in knowing that there are some truths mm. that are immutable, that, are, that, that you know, the, the, the isosceles triangle or, or the, 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 the radius of a circle or, or, or Fibonacci that I'm looking at was the same that Leonardo da Vinci was trying to comprehend and understand and that my kids will learn at school. That is not changing at all because that's the truth of the way the universe is. And it's immutable and in the world that we live in, in our experience of this this earth and this universe that we're in these rules are the rules <laughs> and they're not gonna overnight when you know it's not gonna differ i find a lot of comfort comfort in that mm -hmm. me i sort of feel the opposite <laughs> oh, i feel that um the more i learn and the more i understand the more I realize we know almost nothing. And I you know, agree with you I, there, but I, uh, I like, I, like know, I, I understand <laughs> about the idea of kind of immutable truths. And, and I do understand the, the kind of beauty of repeating patterns in mathematics mm -hmm. and nature, et cetera. But I mean, I think these immutable truths are, are so because for example, I mean, we are locked in a pattern of rotation around a star and our galaxy, our, our galaxy is traveling the around the center of, <laughs> right? And so, so these aren't really, I mean, why is it that we see so many spirals on earth? I mean, this because of how we're traveling, you know, sure. like we're traveling this way and, and we're and we're rotating like, and these forces cause these shapes and these patterns yeah. on, on earth. but none of it is none of it is immutable it can all change it's fixed for earth if we had if we could go on a spaceship and go into another galaxy 
then the rules might all completely be different. But for where or we are now, how are we starting? Because no one, can, no one can tell you what your coordinates are in the universe, can they? No, no one knows for sure where we are exactly in this vast. So it just governs where we are. But we don't know the expanse and the infinite world that exists. We don't know whether there'd be hundreds of millions of rules that we wouldn't even know or understand or it would be completely different but we don't I know mean, we're upside down somewhere else yeah. or if a star went supernova not too far from us who knows how the, these immutable truths on earth would change and how the shapes and patterns of things would change how our mathematics even might change yeah. right so i think we're well, on that human nature to seek to understand the world that we're in it, it, yeah and, and since the beginning of time humans have sought to comprehend and to understand. And one of the ways that we understand is by putting things into patterns, to having regular routines, to having wake up in the morning, you do this, you do this, you do this, and, and the seasons. And the, there's a real beauty in that as well. And I, I think I was talking to a friend and, and she was saying, I mean, my, my sister-in-law lives actually, well, not a friend, my sister-in-law, she lives in Thailand. And Thailand, they have the same all year round, the same climate. And I was saying to her, I feel really lucky I live in a climate where we have four seasons that we can see the spring and the winter and the autumn. Each are different and each are beautiful in their own way. We have this change going on all the time. But for her, she lives in a hot and humid, humid kind of semi-tropical climate all the time. The years and, and the days are the same. They're, they're kind of on the equator. So I think that's really interesting is that even within Earth, there's so much difference. But we seek as human beings to find truth in where we're in and to try and understand the universe from our perspective. And that's the way human people are wired, right? I, I think maybe one of the reasons why at the moment I find so much comfort in uncertainty is because of where we're at. You know, it's maybe part, this is part of the way spiritually I make peace with this moment where we are, mm. is, to, is to really <laughs> revere uncertainty and 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 kind of revel in it you know that that the one the one constant we can always be sure of is change <laughs>